Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with tips on critical listening, our ongoing series on how to be a better listener to not just to classical music, but to music generally. And today I want to talk to you about timbre, sound, sound itself, the sound of particular instruments, and how composers use that sound to do, well, incredibly wonderful, marvelous things and construct large musical edifices. And uh, this is really applies particularly to, to orchestral music, but to a certain degree to all music, of course, because composers are always sensitive to the sound of the instruments that they use. Also, the sound of voices and, you know, sound generally. That's what they're working with. They're working with sound. But quite often in our peregrinations through the universe of classical music, that is completely forgotten. It's, it's forgotten in, in, in normal parlance, in our normal discussions about music, and it's forgotten in the academic discussions about music that determine so much of what we hear and what we're supposed to think is important. And there's a reason for that. The reason is because most of the music that we listen to is tonal music. That is, it's in a key, you know, there are 24 keys in our system, 12 major and 12 minor, and composers usually use one of those, and even later composers who are what they call post-tonal, if they're not atonal or 12-tone or completely, or squeak bloop avant-garde or something like that, they're, they're using normal, traditional, what we call triadic harmony that is based on three notes to make a chord. And so that system has been extensively analyzed. I mean, analyzed to death. And when you study music theory, I mean, one of the things you have to study is, of course, harmony and that system. And so for much of what we consider to be musical history, since, you know, the profession of musicology has existed since like the late 19th century, what, what people have talked about is harmonic systems, harmonic analysis, harmonic theory, the theory of tonal music, and it's a fascinating topic. It's a somewhat abstruse topic, and of course the people who know it are very happy to let the world know that they know it and think that that's the most important thing. But of course, of course it is. It's extremely important. No question about it. It's the whole foundation of musical composition. But it's not necessarily the most important thing you will notice when you hear stuff in terms of the musical surface. I mean, the musical surface is going to be the tune, mostly. And it's also not the only thing. There are other equally important aspects of music of which timbre, sound, just plain old ordinary sound is probably even more fundamental than the harmonic basis of the music it's at some level. It may not be more fundamental to the large scale, large scale former structural organizational thing, but it's important. And I think we all agree with that, right? There's no way that we have evolved to really analyze sound. That's one of the reasons it gets ignored in a lot of the more popular literature on this stuff. It's much easier to say, oh, well, then we hear a theme in C sharp minor, which modulates to the dominant something. And, you know, well, no. I mean, you could say just as easily that we hear the reedy timbre of the oboes. As, you know. Anyway, you see what I'm getting at? But what I want to talk about isn't just sound for its own sake. I mean, the Symphony Orchestra, I think, is probably the most glorious invention in the history of humanity. This amazing ensemble with all of these 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 colors and and timbres available to composers and the way they use them. It's just marvelous. But I'm talking about using sound the way these other people talk about harmony. That is for structural purposes, for, as part of a larger musical composition that includes melody and harmony and rhythm and all of those other things. What does just plain old sound contribute and how sound came to contribute more than it used to? I, it's, it's really an amazing topic, a fascinating topic. And I, I, this has come to me during my experience playing in orchestras as a percussionist. 
because percussion instruments, most of them, you know, are unpitched, at least the traditional ones, cymbals, bass drums, snare drums, triangles, you know, they don't make definite notes. They just make noise. So what is the purpose of noise in a composition which consists entirely of instruments that make actual definitive musical note sounds and harmony? Where, where does it fit? What does it do? Well, primarily percussion instruments mark rhythm, right? That's what, you know, these kinds of percussion instruments, unpitched percussion instruments, they emphasize climaxes, they make noise. They make lots of noise, but they can do more. And when you're performing in an orchestra, you very quickly come to realize that there are some composers who understand how to use the instruments of the orchestra all as a sort of unified force in, in, in pursuing a, a logical musical argument. And your parts are absolutely essential you know, in furthering that argument. And there are other composers who just, you know, use them to mark the rhythm or to make noise. And whether they're there or whether they're not there doesn't make a lot of difference. It's just not terribly important. They don't contribute very much other than noise, but they can contribute music. And it's the musical aspect of timbre that really, really interests me. So I want to give, I've got an example, a couple of musical examples here that sort of, that sort of gives you what I have in mind. And, and that will, I think, you know, rather than my explanation, you know, poor as it is, um, I think that will make the point much more graphically because the composer who understood how to make everything musical, no matter what, was, of course, Haydn, the guy who invented everything. And the piece that he did it very graphically, he did it in a lot of different ways, um, was in his military symphony. Now, it's called a military symphony because it has a second movement, which is a battle piece. It, it's, it's an actual musical depiction of the sounds of battle in those days. Now, the sounds of battle in those days are not the sounds of battle in our day. I mean, the sounds of battle in Haydn's day were rather jolly because music was used going into battle to keep everybody together, to give them, to mark the rhythm, to keep the, you know, the armies marching properly, and also to, to give a sense of heroism and positivity to the horrendous slaughter that was about to ensue, particularly among the poor foot soldiers who were cannon fodder. And so, and so instruments such as trumpets and timpani were military instruments. When Haydn used them in a symphony, he had to requisition them from the barracks from the military. They were carried on horseback and they were, you know, smaller than today's orchestral instruments, the timpani were, and they were actually used in battle. And so he wrote a battle piece um, in the military symphony. And that battle piece uses military instruments, including what was known as Turkish percussion. Turkish percussion because they were invented by Turkish, the Turks. And uh, when the Turks attempted to invade Vienna, which they did a couple of times, uh, you know, they would march into battle with cymbals and bass drums and their own, their own noise-making instruments to keep their side together. And those instruments were absorbed into the symphony orchestra. They were often used in, in exotic operas, operas about, you know, well, Mozart's abduction from the Seraglio, for example, where you would use Turkish instruments because that would set the scene. The music would be 100% Western, classical, normal, traditional, you know, for the most part, anyway. Nothing exotic about it at all, except those percussion instruments, which gave the music a definite locale. And, you know, for that reason, for that reason, Percussion instruments, strange instruments, were banished from the symphony orchestra for many, many, many years. I mean, a long time, really a long time. Certain instruments had extra musical associations, which would be considered absurd in the, in the higher, more artistic, aesthetic, cultured, stylized, elevated expression of pure emotion, which is what you know, people started to think that this stuff was all about. It was never really about that. But I mean, it was in some composers, you know, were kind of the snotty types. But, you know, there was, all, there was always other stuff involved, right? I mean, there always was. But, but the theory, the aesthetic theory, was that your, your music could be more pure, 
and more authentically expressive of just emotion if you banished any thoughts of extra musical objects, including seraglios and, and armies and things like that. Well, Haydn didn't really care about that. Haydn wanted to do, make music that was fun and listenable and, and enjoyable, but also, which also had unity of conception and, and, and the, these higher developmental and formal goals. And he had his cake and ate it too in the military symphony. Because in the military symphony, we have battle music. And I have, I have it right here. Uh, it's here on Naxos as part of their complete Haydn symphony cycle. Let's listen to just the battle with the cymbals and bass drum and triangle thumping along, doing the battle business. Here it is. So it's a battle, right? I mean, you can even you can hear it's it's threatening, it's menacing, it has its happy parts, its triumphant parts, its sad parts. But I mean, it's 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 a battle, and it's a march essentially. So that is the normal use of what you might call non-traditional instruments of timbre, of noise that represents something outside of merely the expression of emotion through melody and harmony which is what some people want to restrict music to do. I'm not one of those people, and neither was Haydn, because in the finale of this symphony, the battle's over. It's gone, done, that was it. The second movement is the battle thing. Everybody loved it. It had to be encored. It was wildly popular. So that was that. But then in the finale, the music's going along with da 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 ba dum ba dum ba da dum. You know, there's a nice catchy tune, and there's a second tune which is just a, a wisp of melody. It's phew ba ba dum ba dum ba dum ba ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum. I mean, it's just the lightest thing in the world. But at the end of the symphony, back come the military instruments, not used in a military way at all. And here is that passage to the end of the symphony. Now, what's going on there? This is the question. 
Here you have the use of timbre, of just noise, of the color of these instruments for no other purpose than for themselves, to make a big joyful noise and bring the symphony to a rousing conclusion. That's what Haydn's doing. And you hear them with both the first theme and the second theme, and they just go crashing all the way to the end. And it's thrillingly exciting, and no one had ever done anything like it before. But what Haydn is doing, because Haydn was just a musician to his very fingertips, is he's telling us, he's telling us something. He's telling us that you can use noise, you can use color, pure color, sound, as a unifying element in a larger symphonic program. Because a symphony, as some of you know, consists of, well, this one, four separate movements. And it's always a question, how do we know all of those movements belong together? How does a composer create a wonderful balance of expression and you know, tempo and form and everything that, you know, you get a little bit of everything that all makes a gigantic, gorgeous, complete casserole of, uh, you know, expressive effects. Well, one of the reasons high ways Haydn does it is by bringing back those instruments in a non-programmatic way, in a way which is not representative of marches and battles and all that stuff. They're just part of the ensemble. They've just come along for the party. And they contribute quite a bit to the success of the party. But they do more than that because the fact that they show up in the second and fourth movements unifies the symphony. This is the military symphony. This is the one that has those instruments. And because they come back at the end for the giant brouhaha, the movements of that symphony are more firmly bound together and linked as unique entities that could only come from this particular work. And that was a discovery. That's something that Haydn did, and we've talked about this in my, my Haydn Symphony Crusade. He did it from the very beginning, and not always with percussion instruments. He did it with English horns, you know, the sound of the English horns in his Philosopher Symphony, where they replaced the oboes. He could do it with a single flute. He could do it with any kind of instrumental color. He did it with horns in the Horn Signal Symphony. He's always trying to find ways to make the symphony, make the group of otherwise somewhat unrelated movements cohere. And one way to make things cohere is just by using sound. And composers have seized on that ever since in wonderful ways. Mozart, for example, Mozart was not a, a composer, of, you know, of, you know, a sound composer quite the way Haydn was. Haydn liked musical objects. He didn't necessarily even feel you needed a tune. You needed a musical thing, some kind of rhythm, a something. He, he tried to find anything that music could do. Mozart was much more interested in vocal music. Mozart wrote long, gorgeous melodies. That's why he's so famous. I mean, that's why he's often considered greater than Haydn, because we relate to melodies more than we relate to musical objects. That's a little abstract. Mozart was singing, always singing, and singing fabulously well. But Mozart had his own approach to timbre. Mozart's characteristic sound was the sound of clarinets. Once he finally got a hold of them, because the clarinet was a new invention in Mozart's day, and Mozart always used the clarinet in his operas whenever he could for love music. That was the sound of sex in Mozart, this seductive, liquid, gorgeously songful and melodic timbre of the clarinet. And Mozart, of course, wrote the world's first and greatest, I mean, clarinet concerto, the world's first great. There were other ones, but you know what I mean. He wrote the, the iconic clarinet concerto and the clarinet quintet. Whenever Mozart could get his hands on a clarinet, he used it. He loved the timbre of the clarinet. And it really represented something very, very significant for him if you look at the music with words where he used the clarinet. So, so, you know, Mozart had his view. And in later composers, you find that, you know, that, that they will also seize on particular colors and use those colors for an entire large work that gives it its unique character. One of the composers who I think was particularly adept at that was Carl Nielsen, the Danish symphonist. His third symphony, the Sinfonia Espansiva, is entirely based on the tone of the oboe. 
all of the main thematic material that the woodwinds play is given to the oboe. I mean, there are three, like three clarinets in the symphony or two or three, I don't know, a bunch of them. <laughs> they don't do anything. It's kind of amazing. But then in his next two symphonies, it's the clarinet that dominates. And one of the things you'll find when you pay attention to timbre, as I'm describing now, is that is that the timbral kings are the woodwind section. Because you've got a fairly large section of instruments. I mean, you've got flutes, oboes, bassoons, and, and clarinets, normally, and French horns, which can function as either brass or as woodwind instruments. They work with both. And and so you can you can color a work by emphasizing something within that family because they all have distinctive colors, distinctive timbres. And it's the handling of the woodwind section that determines great orchestration. I've said this many times, colorful orchestration because they all have distinct sounds. The strings are a unified body. They all sound like strings. And granted, an oboe, I mean, a violin doesn't sound like a cello, which doesn't quite sound like a viola, but they're all recognizably similar and from the same family. But clarinets and oboes and flutes, they do not all sound the same. They're played differently. They make sound differently. Yes, they're all like, you know, pipes with wind going through them, but the way that sound they produce sound is quite different. And the, the noise is quite different. And not only do you have the basic groups, but you have their extended cousins because you have piccolos that go with the flutes. You have oboes, you could have English horns, you could have hecklephones, you could have clarinets and bass clarinets and piccolo clarinets. You could have bassoons and contrabassoons. I mean, there's, there's just whole families of them that you can use to color your orchestration. And that's what great composers do. And that brings us back to percussion. Because after Haydn, there were some composers who really knew what to do with percussion and some composers who just used it decoratively. That is, they used it because they wanted to have noise. But there are also composers who used every instrument in a way which contributes to the musical argument. And the great composer for that was Mahler. Because Mahler, if you play in Mahler symphonies, and if you're a percussionist particularly, it's, you, you feel that you matter. Everything that you do is important. And you, you can't imagine the music without those sounds. One of the classic cases, and some of you probably know, this is in Mahler's Fourth Symphony. The very opening of the symphony is a motive, grace notes, in the flutes, marked by sleigh bells. Jingle, 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 jingle. jingle. That sound colors the entire symphony even when they're not playing. Why? Because Mahler uses them extensively in the first movement, and then that motive comes back in the finale. Not quite the same. It's, it's loud, and it's, it's, it's more ferocious. It's... But it's the same motive that opened the symphony, and it's colored by sleigh bells. The sound of those sleigh bells is what defines that symphony. And we hear it in, in, I mean, whenever Mahler uses percussion instruments generally, they are so integrated into the musical argument. You know, the timpani gets solos, as they do in Haydn, and Beethoven too, by the way. And, and his use of, of the larger percussion section is unbelievably, unbelievably characteristic. And so, and so, you know, you will notice as you listen critically, as a critical listener, that there are composers for whom the use of instruments is part of the musical argument. And there are some composers for whom the use of instruments is just a way to create color and, you know, make the music pretty. <laughs> but, but they're not really doing anything that, that, that has a, a goal-directed or, or musically logical purpose. Um, and that's Richard Strauss. He's one of those, for example. Fabulous orchestration. Absolutely amazing orchestration. He uses tons and tons and tons of instruments. But normally speaking, they're, they're there for color. And that, that's legitimate. That's perfectly fine. They're not there to, to carry an argument along the way that they are with Mahler and his symphonies. This is a distinction that uh, is really very, very common in our musical tradition. The way composers handle sound, timbre. They can do it with extreme virtuosity, but they can also do it with virtuosity and musical logic. <laughs>
And it's a, it's a subtle distinction, granted, but it's something I want you to think about when you listen, because the, the, the great composers are always aware of these things. They really are. And, and there's more to music, and I say this all the time, than just the tune. A lot more to music. And some of the most wonderful things in music are not the tune. They are the way composers handle material. And the fabric of music can be all kinds of different things. Things which are absolutely unique to music and to no other art or medium. And timbre is one of those things. It's one of those things that music has. It's like color in painting. It's, music has it, nothing else has it. And how a composer uses it is one of those things that's, that's going to determine the pleasure you get out of a piece of music and how quickly you understand what it's doing and how it impresses you. And so the, the more open you are to the different kinds of things that music can do, timbrally, uh, the greater your understanding and the more rapid your uptake is going to be. And I think this little example from Haydn really says it all in a way, doesn't it? Because you've got the two, the balance of the two things that sound can do. It can remind you of something else. It can simply keep the rhythm going, or it can, it can contribute also to the overall unification of a work, to the identity of that work, to the expressive point of that work. It can do all of those things. And the great composers, of course, do everything all the time. That's what makes them great. So keep on listening, friends. I hope this little tip on critical listening has given you a bit of uh, uh, food for thought, sound for thought. Take care.